All right, welcome. It is six o'clock on Wednesday, September 15th. I want to call to order this special um, school board or the study session, rather, special meeting of the school board. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that masks are required at our school board meetings and that all indoor activities in the school district. So this time, will everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item 2.01 is the adoption of the agenda. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda or to propose any changes. Andrew, I have a question on the board consent agenda. If we if we approve the agenda as written now, will we be able to pull out any of those or discuss them if, if needed? If needed. Yes. Yeah, I, I was gonna say I think. Because we're just approving that item. We're not necessarily saying how we're going to. Okay, because the consent agenda, that. you can always break up. Okay, got it. Then I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as written. All right, there's been a motion to approve the agenda as written. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. All right, the next item on the agenda 3.01 is an update on the superintendent search process. At our special school board meeting on June 15th, three months ago, I can't believe that's how long ago it's been, but we interviewed three search firms and made a unanimous decision to engage the services of Northwest Leadership Associates. Specifically, we hired two of the firm's consultants, Wayne Robertson and Mark Venn, to lead our search. At about the same time the board selected Northwest Leadership Associates, Dr. Quinn and her team were interviewing candidates to find a new director of communications and community engagement for the district. As you know, their process ended with the hiring of Selena Rodriguez at officially at our August school board meeting. And while Selena has many strengths that she brings to, um, to the district, there is uh, her recent experience in her experiencing her recent experience serving as a liaison between the Mount Vernon School Board and the search consultants at Northwest Leadership Associates. They use the same firm for their search. So it's very fortunate for us. Uh, Selena has been through a similar process at a nearby district. And when I asked her, she agreed to take the lead role from the district side in facilitating our process in Ferndale. So Selena has made arrangements for Wayne Robertson to join us this evening via Zoom. She's also put together two documents that we received Monday night attached to Dr. Quinn's weekly update that have also been posted on board docs. So at this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to Ms. Rodriguez to make any other introductory comments and then get us started with a, a conversation with Dr. Robertson. You ready for me? You oh, there we go. Do you, all, you all have the two documents? Okay. Well, I am familiar with them and the items on those documents. Um, I can't take credit for it because they did come from Northwest Leadership. Um, and I do have to say that I am so grateful to have one go around under my belt going into the process with um, the Ferndale team. Um, with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Robertson to um, about All right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's it's going to be fun working with Selena again on this. She played a very important role in the Mount Vernon search. Um, as you know, I'm Wayne Robertson, and I'll be one of the two consultants working with the Ferndale District on your superintendent search. Uh, Mark Venn uh, would be here tonight, but he's camping somewhere in British Columbia, and we were nervous about his internet connection and that uh, he could pass on this uh, event. Um, but for most activities, the two of us will be present and uh, working as a team um, with support from the, the other uh, associates in Northwest Leadership and Dennis Ray and Tom Rockefeller who are kind of uh, sharing the CEO position with our firm now. 
we're excited about uh, working with the district on the Ferndale search. This is going to be uh, it's an excellent job. The district has a great reputation. Um, you're in a nice timeline uh, window and with uh, uh, Linda's transition and, and Mark's transition into the interim role. So uh, I think you're in a good spot all the way around and uh, we'll look forward to uh, facilitating the search for you. I, I know you have a busy agenda. I looked over your agenda and, and I appreciate um, being in the lead off role and but you have a lot of work to do. So um, I can go a number of directions. We can go fairly quickly through the agenda um, that I sent you or we can um, pick up parts of it or do Q and A or however you'd like to do it. Um, some uh, direction from you will get us started, please. Well, I, I know we're all anxious to, to know the next steps and where we're going from here. So uh, we can start with that. And then as we go, board members feel free to ask questions. Good idea. If, if you, I know you have the agenda and board docs and we probably don't need to have it on the screen, but just very quickly, the first couple of items are just background. And you know that from the earlier comments um, about the interview in June and the selection of Northwest leadership, and you took action on our contract in June. So we're, we're off and running. Um, we submitted a timeline that is just a draft and we look at um, kind of your board meeting dates and, and uh, just kind of some general considerations around holidays and vacations and such. And we put together a timeline that works for uh, Mark and myself, um, but that's just a draft. And we would expect to work with staff um, Selena and, and um, others in the district um, to fine tune that and move it around uh, to make it work for you. So that is probably the next step. Um, and we don't have to do that tonight, certainly, uh, given the, the scope of your meeting. But um, that gives you a general idea of uh, starting soon in October, probably, and finishing up by your spring break and um, having the position posted um, in December, open through the winter break, uh, open through um, through the, uh, the January and February, uh, probable closing date of February 25, which is a nice long window, but it's early enough um, where you're still in that sweet spot. Um, a report to the board, selection of semifinalists in March, and probably two rounds of interviews toward the end of March with an announcement of a selection right around the end of March. We picked March 25, but that's a to be determined date. Um, the other uh, next step would be um, kind of two levels of posting. The first one is very simple. Get it posted on the WASA and WASDA websites. Uh, sometimes we post positions on the AAS, AASA, the National Association website. Um, we're really not big fans of that, but if it was something the district wanted to do, we could pursue that. Um, we'll, you know, nowadays every search is a intergalactic search, so anybody in, you know, Connecticut or New York or Massachusetts or wherever, if they're interested in a superintendent position in Washington State, about two clicks gets them to our position announcement. So um, that's something we can, you can think about. We can talk about it cost five or six hundred dollars would be in addition to our current uh, level of compensation. Um, it's just a, an option, something to think about, not something we're recommending. Um, the other next step would be scheduling the focus groups. And that's probably the biggest uh, activity toward the front end of the, of the process. And in doing that, we would need you in the district, um, it's, Selena's lead probably, uh, identifying the groups, developing a schedule, um, working with us on the, the format and the content. Typically with the focus groups, um, we, Mark and I would be on Zoom most likely. And um, we typically ask three questions, what's going well in the district? What might be your concerns? And what are the attributes and characteristics you're looking for in the next superintendent? And then we put that information together in a summary form and present that to the board um, a week or so after the focus group. So we'd like to do the, 
the focus groups, um, we penciled in November 16 and 17, nothing uh, magic about those dates, but right around in that general time frame uh, before Thanksgiving, and then come back shortly thereafter and give you a report that basically said, this is what your stakeholders are saying. Um, uh, we know that um, um, there'll be a lot of interest in that. We, we were hesitant about doing focus groups remotely, but after doing several searches last year where our focus groups were done that way, we found that um, the participation is greatly increased. Some people might question the quality, um, just like you find in your meetings and your interaction. But in terms of sheer numbers and voice into the process, the, the remote format works extremely well. And we probably would suggest going with that or some combination of, of remote for some groups, like perhaps your cabinet or you know smaller groups where distance and access is not a, a concern and then remote for larger groups. So we can, we can work on that. Um, on that as well um, with, with your staff and, and uh, whoever you want to have involved in that. Um, and then after the focus groups, we use that information. Oh, excuse me, let me back up. Another step that would happen fairly early is um, the, um, the development, which, which, no, not the development, the posting of an online uh, survey so that uh, st stakeholders, community members, staff, students can, um, if they choose not to participate in the focus group or if they want a different format for providing input, they can make a, um, access the, the online survey. We can get that up and running. What we typically do is we show the district the survey that we have. And if the district wants to do something else, we're open to that. It's a fairly simple process. Um, and ours is pretty generic as you can well imagine because we work with lots of districts, but it seems to work um, and it's been successful. Some, uh, a few times districts have chose to do something else and, that, and that's perfectly fine with us and we can work with your staff and, and get that figured out. But those, those aspects, those activities are the, are the upfront, get it posted on WASA and WASDA, possibly AASA, um, get the focus group scheduled, get the online survey up. Um, usually, um, and Selena knows this, you would uh, dedicate a page on your website where people could get information about the search and that's where they could access the online survey. That's where they would see the schedule um, for the focus groups. That's perhaps that's where they could get a link to, uh, to being a participant in the focus group and other information relative to the search um, would be available on, on your district website. Um, and then as we uh, work with your staff and get you to approve the timeline, and we, by late October, mid-October, um, we'd like to have the board sign off on the approval of the timeline. So a couple of interactions with staff and maybe a reading to the board. And if you want us, Mark and me, to come back and walk through that timeline uh, more formally in a, at a board meeting so that your community gets to see it and see where they'll be involved. Uh, we're, we're definitely open to do that too. This, this session just kind of to get us started. Um, position to be posted, you know, early on would be open for quite a while. We come back, it kind of sits after it's posted um, and you kind of wonder what's going on. And from your perspective, not too much is going on. Um, from our perspective, a lot is going on. After the position is posted, we reach out to candidates and do our targeted recruiting we hear from candidates that see the posting and they contact us. Um, we're quite aggressive uh, in terms of our, of our recruiting and that's what we'll be doing January and February. We've actually had some contacts from potential candidates already. Um, as people know that you have an interim and they know the position's gonna be posted um, and they know that we're doing the search. So the, it, it's out there informally and it'll be out there formally uh, very soon. Um, we come back and uh, we have January 25th. We come back late January and give you a mid-search report. And that's an opportunity for us to tell you what kind of interest we're getting and who we're hearing, not who we're hearing, how many people we're hearing from, um, what their backgrounds are like. We tell the candidates that their uh, application to the process is confidential. 
until uh, way down the road when the board announces the um, schedule for the semifinalist uh, interviews. So that way the candidates have a lot of time to think about it. They have some internal communications that they have to take care of and they don't want their name out there too soon. Um, and they might decide not to follow through with the application. So when we give you the mid search report, we'll tell you, we think we're gonna have 20 applicants. Uh, we know from four or five uh, in-state superintendents that they're interested. We have some out-of-state people that are we're, we're talking to give you a general idea of what it's what the pool applicant pool is going to look like and we also do take that opportunity to discuss the semifinalist interviews and the finalist interviews we start talking about interview questions we talk about the format format whether it's going to be remote whether it's going to be in person all of those details we can work out uh, late january and get it ready for february um, and march uh, february closing and then march interviews um, we recommend two rounds of interviews, and we've identified a Saturday in March, March 8th. The Saturday works well for the candidates, obviously, because they're not at work. And it, it's, it's nice to do them in one day where you interview maybe six people or so. Um, could be five, could be seven. Um, and we've done those in person, and we've done them remotely. Um, so that's something for us to talk about. Uh, the remote option um, takes the concern about number of people in the room and that kind of thing off the table. Um, doesn't quite give you the same setting. Recently, we did one where the board and the semifinalists were in the room, along with a couple of other staff members, but the audience was in an adjacent room in the building or they were uh, observing the process on Zoom. What we like to see is the board doing those semifinalist interviews in some variation of a public setting, and then a, an opportunity for observers to the process to provide input um, on what they saw and what they heard, um, not necessarily voting along with the board, but uh, providing you know, well-informed input to the process. And then after the last interview, the board goes into executive session and uh, uh, deliberates, debriefs, selects their finalists for the final round of interview, which we have scheduled for March 21, 23, and 24. I think Tuesday, I think that's a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Your board meetings are on Wednesdays. So I think Mark skipped that date when you had a board meeting. So board meetings uh, are, I was say, board, board meetings are on Tuesday, oh, last Tuesday of the month. Well, maybe I've got that. Maybe I've got that wrong. Anyway, we got plenty of time to figure that out. That's right. I saw that off your website tonight. You're correct. I stand corrected. Uh, but anyway, we like to see three finalists invited into the district. One fight, one finalist per day, spending a full day in the district, meeting with various stakeholder groups in little forums um, where uh, can't the, the participants get an opportunity to interact with the candidate. Now, some of those might have to be on Zoom, um, depending on what's going on in March of 2022. But um, either way, we, we've done it both ways and we can make, we can make that work. Um, and that's an opportunity for some real um, in greater depth interaction between uh, stakeholder groups and, um, and the candidates, the three finalists. And then we recommend an executive session interview with the candidates, with the, just the board candidates, probably Mark and myself, Mark Venn and myself in the room, um, where's an opportunity for the board to interact face-to-face, -face, executive session, um, more of a free flowing uh, interview setting. Um, that's basically the last look the board has at the candidates before their final deliberation and their final selection and then the announcement. Um, typically what happens with the finalist interviews, um, the last interview wraps up about nine o'clock at night, maybe 10 o'clock at night, and then the board deliberates after that. They might continue those deliberations to the following day. 
So we suggest a special board meeting after the third round of interviews where the board can come out in open session and, and with a roll call vote, make the announcement as to the next superintendent. Um, by then we will have conducted a third party background check. We will um, have pre-negotiated the contract within your parameters and you'll be ready to make the appointment of your um, super, next superintendent at your next regular business meeting, probably at the end of March. And then the new superintendent starts on July 1. Um, so that, that's kind of the timeline, that's kind of the process that we envision. All of those steps are, you know, can be adjusted if, uh, if need be, if you have a, another, uh, something that you'd like to see in the process. Um, the signature, I think of our searches, and I think Selena would back this up, is a lot of participation, a lot of transparency, um, a lot of uh, input for the board, but the board retaining control of the process and definitely control of the appointment and the announcement. Um, we think you're gonna get a strong field of applicants. You're gonna have a tough time selecting your semi-finalists and hopefully a very tough time uh, selecting your finalists and you're gonna get somebody that's a good fit to take your district to the next level for the next several years. Uh, questions about any of that uh, timeline process, um, maybe next steps, I guess is where Andrew you wanted us to go. It's, it's, it's a pretty packed timeline for sure. I'm just wondering if there are anything to have, whether we can have any um, public forum in October or late October, if there's any reason to try and look at that, um, just so November's not so, uh, well, I don't know. I was, I was looking at, at that uh, this afternoon in preparation for the meeting. I think we can we can maybe make some adjustments around that. Um, I think if if Selena could get some input uh, from the, you know, from the superintendent and from the board members, and then she and I can talk in the next few days, we can see what we want to do and maybe get you another timeline that matches up with some of your dates um, a little better than our prediction of what your dates might be. Would that uh, would that work for you? Sure. Wayne, as we go into that discussion, um, I can only compare to my experience with Mount Vernon, um, but in your experience with working with other districts, what would you say our, our timeline compares to others as far as I know, I know, you know, just like any, any district you want to ensure a quality pool of candidates, um, would you say we're early or later on in the search process comparing to other districts? What we found is being too early is worse than being too late. We've filled uh, positions in April and done just fine. And we've had a couple of searches where, I mean, it, it, it makes sense to think the earlier you get out, the better off you're gonna be. But there are a lot of candidates that aren't ready um, to, to jump in the pool uh, too early. And they don't wanna be, um, if, they're, if they're going through the process, they don't want that long window uh, where they're out there and all the turmoil that creates in their districts. And so they, they just hold back and, and don't bite. Um, and there's also uh, the, the timeline of districts running levies in February. And they sometimes, uh, superintendents don't wanna make decisions or announcements of something like this uh, prior to the, uh, an election in their district. So we think this is a good timeline. Um, it's, it's not too early and it's definitely not too late. You're gonna have your, your superintendent uh, position filled um, right around spring break. It gives you time for some transition activities. Um, so I, I think it's a, good, it's a good timeline. We wouldn't wanna, we, we, we wouldn't wanna move the closing date up much. Um, we can move some of the internal activities around a little bit if there's some, uh, things, some things going on in the district that we might not know about that you wanna avoid. I think we can, we can fine tune that a little bit and get it to uh, where you want it to be. But I don't think we wanna move uh, the end of the process up too much. Maybe, I mean, not more than a week or so um, and get out in front of the candidate pool. Does that make sense? 
Yes. Can yes. you can you talk about what it will look like um, for those final interviews? What does a day? I'm I'm assuming there's three days because we were thinking like three candidates maybe, and each candidate has a day. What will that day in your yeah. mind look like? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a long and grueling day for the candidates. Let me tell you. Um, they start about seven thirty or eight o'clock in the morning, and they're usually greeted by um, somebody from the district. It could be Selena. It could be your interim superintendent. Um, it could be a board representative, and Mark and I will be there. Um, and then we get them started. We go over the day schedule. They will have already seen the schedule, so there's no surprises there. But we want to make sure that everybody's locked into what the schedule is going to be. Typically, as you imagined and, and said, um, they go through a schedule of of short 30 minute, 45 minute meetings with district staff, cabinet, uh, principals. Uh, typically in the middle of the day, there's a, there, there might be a, an opportunity to tour a couple schools, maybe a meeting with, with students at the high school, something like that, to get them kind of out in the district a little bit. Um, uh, some time with the outgoing superintendent. Um, and then um, afternoon session, sometimes there's a community meeting there in the like at one o'clock or something like that depending on you know we've done with rotary meetings we've we've done with um uh senior center visits we've done all kinds of different things so if there's some particular group that you want to slide in there um that early afternoon and the the best time to meet with the staff we find is secondary staff probably has a dismissal around 2 15 or 2 30 or something like that so give them about 15 minutes and then have a session for secondary staff, take about a half hour, 45 minutes, and then about 3.30 or 4 o'clock, whatever the dismissal times were, a session for um, uh, elementary staff. And then you don't want to forget classified staff. Sounds like, seems like to us around 9 o'clock in the morning is a good time to hit the transportation department as they're coming in from their morning run. So, you know, it, it all depends on how things are, what the logistics are in the district but you're right it's just a series of meetings and at each of those meetings the candidate makes five minute opening remarks and then it's just questions from the group because the cabinet questions for each of the candidates are going to be way different than the elementary teachers questions and the transportation department questions are going to be way different and this is a chance for each of those groups to envision how would this person be as our next superintendent. How would that affect me? How would it affect my department? How would that all play out? And then at every one of those stations, there's a way for them to provide input into the process, either electronically or old school with paper pencil, uh, kind of depending on how we set it up or a combination thereof. And then all of that information comes together. And then, oh, excuse me. Um, and then after that, that meeting with the probably elementary staff, um uh, a short break maybe and then we recommend a very casual informal meeting with the candidate and two board members not five because you don't want to have it be a, a regular board meeting but then a rotation of two board members so over the three days each of the board members gets to have dinner with somebody but probably nobody has dinner with all three of them and then um, after that, then a six o'clock community forum, possibly remote, possibly in person, possibly a combination thereof, where it's the same kind of thing. The candidate makes opening remarks, and then it's questions from the community members. That's also an opportunity for anybody who couldn't participate during the day at their scheduled time. They can, they can weigh in on that six o'clock meeting. And then a short, very short break, and then a 7.30 or so, executive session interview with the board, maybe 45 minutes. Um, whereas the preliminary interview is very structured with every candidate getting the same question. The executive session interview with the board is more of a conversation because you might have one candidate who has never been a superintendent. You might have one candidate that's been a superintendent in Washington and you might have another candidate from out of state. So you might have different questions 
with the different candidates talking about their transition, talking about where they're going to live, you know, any of that kind of stuff could uh, could vary greatly. So that's that's uh, that's the final step, and then at the end of that, you know, candidate number one leaves, candidate number two comes in the next morning. We do the same thing. So the time commitment from the board is really that five o'clock session um, with for two board members for dinner, and then we we recommend that the that the board members observe the community forum so they can see how the candidates interact with the community. Um, and then of course the executive session interview three nights in a row. And then we suggest the candidate that the board does not deliberate each night, maybe a short debrief to make sure everybody's on the same page and heard the same thing, that kind of thing. But until you've seen all three candidates, you don't want to start forming your opinions too much. Um, it's kind of hard not to, but um, but save the deliberations, the real serious del deliberations for after you've seen all three candidates, you've got all the input on all three candidates from all these sources, and then you've got a lengthy deliberation on the night after the third interview, which can sometimes carry over into the next morning and then a special board meeting to make the announcement after you locked everything in. Did that, did that help? That's fabulous, thank you. Dr. Robertson, I have a question on all of those meetings during the day, the interviews with the school staff. How do we as a board get that information before we do our deliberation? Do you put it in a report or the Selena, how does that happen? We've done, it, we've done it a couple of different ways. And as, as time has gone on, it's gotten more sophisticated where the last couple of searches we did last year, um, people used a, a Google product to, to basically, it's, I don't, Selena, did we do this in Mount Vernon? No, we did actually. Yeah, yeah I, think by, I think when we went from Mount Vernon to Cedro Woolley, we picked up a way for them to do it electronically. And then when we went to Stanwood, we even fine tuned it a little more. So there's a Google product that people can um, sit through their session and then go right online and register their, their input, their comments. And so at the end of the day, then you get a spreadsheet um, on that particular candidate that's anonymous for the participants, of course, and um, tells you know what, whether they're a principal or a teacher and it tells what their comments were with respect to each of the three uh, guiding questions for the process. So that comes around pretty fast, um, particularly on the third day. Some people like to wait and do their input after they've seen all three candidates, which is kind of understandable, slows the process down a little bit. But it does all come together um, before you're do doing your deliberations after the last round. What you have to have you have to have some time, obviously. Um, so some of the input you can read as you go, you can get as you go, and then some of it comes in at the last minute, particularly on, on the third candidate. Um, so you have to, after your last interview with the third candidate, you have to allow some time for you to catch up on that and then go into your deliberations with all that input. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was I was just hoping that before we interviewed them in the evening, we would have some idea of how their day went yeah. with the rest. And yeah. you, you, know, Pat, you, you have the things that might be to see like themes that came up. And yeah, yeah. And, and one of the questions that that boards often ask during that last interview was, how was your day? You know, what any surprises? You know, how did it go? What did you think? And yeah, you can to the extent that people fill out their uh, that online survey right after their session or shortly after their session, you would have that information prior to your interview with um, for your executive session interview. Yeah, we can make we can make that happen to the degree that they fill out the survey. Other questions about the uh, last day, the final day. Okay, in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna go back to, to a couple of talking points off the agenda that I sent and pick up a couple of things that we haven't probably covered. Uh, that's okay, Andrew? Yes, that's fine. Okay, so um, 
I mentioned the brochure. So we will start working right as we're doing the focus groups. Uh, we'll start uh, drafting the brochure, getting pictures from Selena. Um, we'll have a session uh, during the focus groups where we'll have some kind of time with each board member and we can get your take on what the characteristics and the qualifications you're most interested in. So we can have a pretty good draft of the brochure ready to go as, um, as we're wrapping up the focus groups. So there's not a, we're not starting at square one after the focus groups and then getting going on it. We'll get information about your district, about the community, um, any information that uh, you want included in that brochure. We'll be working on that kind of as we go. That process will start uh, fairly soon. And um, you'll get an opportunity to look that brochure over before it goes out. Um, it doesn't go out until you say it's ready to go out. Um, and so that's a pretty important piece of the process. Um, one of the things you'll need to think about, and we'll ask you probably when we have that individual time, um, is uh, some characteristics and qualifications. So it says residency. You want them to live in the district. Most districts do, um, but um, we, we'll want to make sure we'll want to verify that if that's a, a requirement or is it a desired characteristic and, and we'll have a little conversation about that. We'll want um, to get from you. Do you want somebody with superintendent experience and is that a requirement or is that a desired characteristic? Do you want them to have a doctorate or do you care about that? Um, that sort of thing. So we'll want to we'll want to get that into the process. Some of our conversations along the way. I talked a little bit about recruiting. If there's a, a candidate that you think you're interested in and you want us to know about, and that we might be we probably know about them, but we might not, and um, surface their name, and we'll follow up with them. We don't want to leave any uh, stones unturned, and uh, we're not bashful about reaching out to uh, potential candidates. Um, I mentioned that as we wrap up the process, we pre-negotiate the contract with your, within your parameters. What we like to have districts do is start fairly soon. And if you haven't done this, if you have done it, great, or good for you. If you haven't done it, it's a good time to review the superintendent contract. And if, if there's some, um, items in there that you don't want to carry forward, this is a good time to clean that up. If there's some things in there you've been wondering about that maybe should be added, this is a good time to do that. Um, the Educational Sur Service District um, has been known, I can't really speak for them, but they've been known to do pretty good salary analyses uh, for their me member districts. Um, if that, that's a request you might want to think about making, uh, your superintendent, Mark, could talk with Larry Francois about that and see if that's an option. We do, we can do a salary comparison for you. Um, ours is not as sophisticated. We don't have access to some of the same information and we don't have quite the horsepower, the bandwidth that the Educational Service District does for doing that kind of work. But we can get you a, a salary comparison that'll get you pretty close to what the market is uh, in Washington State for districts your size in Western Washington and that sort of thing. Um, that's something we can we can talk with uh, your staff about and see if you want us to do that. I mentioned a third party background check. Um, once the finalists are selected, we, con Northwest Leadership Associates, contracts with a firm in Spokane and they run a third party background check on each of your finalists that looks into their financial picture, um, their legal criminal, background, which should be okay, I hope. And um, also the, the thing that they do is very important is they, they verify their academic credentials. So if the person says they have a doctorate from some out of state university that we've never heard of, um, they'll verify that that, in, that university exists and it's accredited and indeed the person does have a doctorate. So um, that uh, gives you another layer of, of, of security and insulation um, complete the process. Um, media and communication, you've got a great communication person and we're looking forward to working with her. And she knows the drill and, and is very effective in, in guiding the communication aspects. And, and particularly with your Latinx uh, community, 
which was, a, uh, as you can imagine, a, a big deal in the Mount Vernon School District. And um, she taught us a lot as we went through that search. We've refined a couple of things, uh, Selena, and, um, and are working on changing our online survey for the Labnex uh, population group. And, um, and we'll look forward to working with you on that. Um, we're willing to take uh, whatever role you want us to do uh, with the media. Um, you know, your internal communications are, are in good hands and uh, your website, it looks great. As a matter of fact, and I'm sure it's just gonna get better and there'll be uh, plenty of opportunity to highlight the superintendent search uh, on your website, but we'll play whatever role in that you want us to play. Uh, more time commitment on the search. We wanna minimize your time. We know you're busy and you've got a lot of other board work to do uh, other than detail work on the search. So we're, we, we're inclined to work primarily with staff, maybe board president and staff, um, but we're open to taking questions from individual board members. Um, you have, or Selena has, our contact information. And, uh, one of us is virtually always available. And, um, and we, we're open to meeting face-to-face -face if that's what um, you prefer. This is nice and it's handy. It's pretty easy for us. In some ways it's, it's uh, better and safer and smarter. Um, but we're open to whatever format uh, meets your needs. And, um, and, and support you in any way that we possibly can. We wanna minimize the board's time and, um, but not leave you out of the loop. Um, so I think we're pretty good communicators uh, working back through uh, your district contact person and um, the district staff and, and the board president, if, you know, however you choose us to do that. Um, I've covered what I thought we needed to cover and hopefully answered your questions. Uh, any more questions, I'd be happy to do that. And if you're ready to sign me off and get on with the rest of your agenda. Um, good with that. One quick question. Um, I know you've mentioned as far as meeting with the board individually and some questions you'll have. Is it possible to get those questions ahead of time just so we have some time to put a little more thought into, you know, because you were talking about qualifications yeah. and I would like to think about that as opposed to just being sure. on the spot. Yeah, maybe, maybe I wasn't very clear on that. All we're looking for is what are you looking for in the next superintendent? Okay. And then um, the residency thing would we'll just ask you that. You know, you can be thinking about that. Um, doctorate, you can be thinking about that. Um, Really, it's 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 more of a open-ended kind of process, um, but I can provide you anything. Uh, I can provide some talking points if you'd like, um, or we can flesh that out. It can be telephone. It can be remote. It can be in person if we're in the district that day, or a combination of all those things. Does that help? That does. Thank you. Okay. So, in regards to the background checks that you do. Um, once we select our three finalists, the background check is done. Do we have those results before we go public with our finalists? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it takes us about two days to turn those around. And, um, and we just get a verbal report from Dennis Ray that says, we've heard back from Pinnacle Investigators and John Smith background check cleared fine. And, and then we just share that information with you. Um, they're hesitant to write a report, um, but we get the loop closed so that we know that you've got that information going forward. But yeah, we, we want you to have that and we want you to have a verbal assurance from the candidate that they're good to go on the contract so that you know that if you announce John Smith or Sally Smith as your next superintendent, that there's not gonna be any surprises both from their background or from uh, hesitation on the contract. Could we see some samples of brochures? Could you send us some samples of your brochures that you've sure. sent out like, sure. for others? I for can get those. I can get those off to Selena in the morning. Thank you. There's some online. Yeah, you bet. And the what what the thing to remember? Two things to remember. If you look at it in a print copy. It looks kind of clunky because the page breaks are weird when it's once it's turned into a PDF print hard copy. Online, that's not a problem, of course. 
Um, the other thing to remember is the audience is the candidate. That's who we want to send it out to. When we do our targeted recruiting, we send them a copy of the brochure and we send them a, a, a it's our application form, but it says Ferndale School District at the top of it. So it's a Ferndale School District application form at that point. And that's what we used, you know, to say so and so. We think you ought to be taking a look at the Ferndale job. It's a great opportunity, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we want them to see in the brochure what the district's looking for in the next candidate. Um, sometimes we get kind of bogged down in people thinking it's a advertisement for the district. And it is to a sense, but to a very limited audience. So yeah, we can, I'll get you some copies. You can look it over. And um, you, you'll have uh, some great pictures. I've seen pictures on your website of opening school and your school construction. And uh, you'll have, we can do a real nice job. We contract, you don't have to worry about me being the page, but being the uh, desktop publisher, we contract that out. She does a great job, turns it around fast. And you'll get, you can look at it two or three times before you finally uh, sign off on it. And it doesn't go out till the board president tells us it's ready to go out. Anything else? Any question? Yeah, any question? All right, well, thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Selena, for helping. We look forward to getting underway and getting uh, knee deep in the process. Okay, I'll circle back through Selena probably in the morning and um, we'll get a couple things moving and I'll uh, get copies of the brochures to you and uh, start uh, talking with her about uh, fine tuning that timeline. Okay? Thanks, Sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> Good luck with the rest of your meeting. We've got some big uh, weighty uh, agenda items on there and I appreciate your leadership work. This is a challenging time to be a, a member of a school board or in a leadership role in a in a school district. So good for you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Bye, Bye, Bye. Bye. Um, like Wayne mentioned, we want to organize um, more time on this process. And so what my role looks like um, is in the communications on behalf of the board. So uh, I was looking at the timeline. Um, it looks like at least four press releases will come out um, of my office on behalf of the school board, um, and that will typically go out so we can we can discuss um, you know the local heralds, the local newspapers who will be included back in Mount Vernon, as well as um, the Chamber of Commerce and anyone else that you think is appropriate. Um, it'll also look like we communicating um, internally via um, email with. Um, the different union leaders, um, communicating regularly with them to provide um, the different opportunities for, for their members um, to be involved in the process. Um, um, opportunity for um, participation. And other than that, if you have any other questions for me, my role in this, I'm really excited to be doing this again. Um, it is a long process, it's um, exhausting, but it's so fun and it's exciting. Well, we're excited to have you. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I'm so glad you're excited. Uh, we're really excited to have you. So it's great. What is the election day in February next year, do you know? Is it a So can I ask an awkward question? Sure. We do all the time. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at this timeline, and like I said, this is kind of awkward. Um, but I'm just I want to throw it out to see if there's anything we should do. Um, but in my mind, selecting the new superintendent is probably one of, if not the biggest roles of the board and things that we need to do. And right in the middle of this timeline is the November election, and I, I don't want to be, I don't know what I want to be, this is where it gets awkward, but both two of our senior, more senior seasoned board members who've been through this process are up for election. And if- This year? This year. Oh, yeah. Did you, oh, I can talk to you about it later. Um, but it is, you know, 
dependent on what happens with that election, how do we maintain the, the continuity? Thank you. Yeah, and the flow of this and, um, and I don't know if maybe that was a question I should have asked when Dr. Robertson was on, but it, it, like I said, it's kind of awkward and I wasn't sure how to bring it up or how to, you know, because you guys have at least been through the process. I mean, I was around, I was in the studio audience when Linda was interviewed, but, um, you know, wasn't their process. And for, frankly, we have seen if he's been <laughs> through it, you know, um, which I'm very grateful for that because you know, experience is a great teacher. But, you know, I was thinking, do we, and again, this is where it gets awkward and I don't want it to be awkward, but I'm just trying to throw it out for discussion. Do we invite those other candidates to be here in the open sessions, just they hear what's going on? Because I would, you know, hate to all of a sudden have somebody new or two people new on the board that haven't been through this process at all or aren't aware of what's going on or is that their responsibility or I would hope that as somebody running for school board you're aware of what's going on yeah you I, would hope. I, think, say, I think I think it honest. might be um right of our communication team to let them know about it but I think if a candidate for school board knows it's going on and chooses not to pay attention, that <laughs> might be something for um, you know, yeah. consideration. Well, the, the real fact of it is we're just, based on this timeline, we really will just be getting into, into the process when right. the election occurs. Yeah. The, election date? the November is the second. Second, Second Tuesday, November. Yeah. I have to look at the calendar. First. 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 Yeah, first. February is the second. Every, yeah. November, November the second. November second. November second. So I mean, Maybe it won't have been that happen. much that's happened other than our opinion of what we're looking for. Right. And some of that they may have to come in and be okay with. I, I don't know how far that might be. Yeah. Forcing, but I mean. I, I, yeah, agree with Linda, I think if the candidates want to participate, they'll tune in. Yeah. And those aware. candidates would be sworn in at the end of November. November it's so. not like you know January 20th, inauguration day type of thing. Yeah. So there if if there is a change in leadership during that time, it's only up until the position being posted on the website or the that they wouldn't have a right a role in, I guess. They don't get their ideas in the brochure. No. But you know, that's they're gonna have plenty of other opportunities. Right. Yeah. Well, and I I would I would echo and agree with what Melinda says. I mean, if they truly want to be involved, you know, there's plenty of open public, you know, there's maybe none of those that they can attend. And that goes the same for any person wanting to be involved, whether exactly. they're running for school board or not. We have a lot of opportunity for the public or staff or you know, whoever to be involved in pay attention to. And, and once we finalize this, some version of this will be published, not every internal date, but right. dates when people just come to it. Yeah. I didn't think that was awkward at all. So, okay, good. I, you should, like, I just think that way. It's a, it's a valid discussion. Yeah. The, and I guess the one thing that I would echo with you moving on is that I'm wondering that November 16th and 17th is like right before the, the WASDA. I'm almost wondering if the week before would be a little bit better for the focus groups, although there's some holidays in November that looking at the calendar well that's why i ask about October. it seems like we're kind of letting october <laughs> well if we did so, do work and, in and for community groups i mean to to gather information about opinions and stuff there's no downside to doing some of that in october yeah. i mean obviously we won't have candidates and for sure so but we can at least get opinions well it looks like he had the board approving the search plan and timeline for our october Business meeting, so we would have to do that in the September business meeting. Sure. 
our special meeting in October. I just hate to have November suddenly start this crammed two months leading up to you know both Thanksgiving and Christmas and trying to get things ready for January. And we've had time in October where we could also be talking to teachers. And if we need to approve a plan, we can certainly plan going forward. I, I don't think that's a problem. But I, I would like to see us have broader opportunities maybe in October for the community that rather than risk losing some people because other things are happening in November. Well, and particularly if we do it in October and you know we do it via hybrid or Zoom or whatever, and we find, okay, that didn't really work well. We didn't get the participation. We've still got some time to regroup, regroup and do something else. Whereas if we do it in November, then it goes into that holiday time when you don't have time to do. You know, they've got other things going on. So I, I would, and in my mind, I don't think community, community input October versus November is not going to be a, it's not going to change significantly. So I would be more for moving that time on yeah. that portion of it forward. I like the rest of it. We'll let you work on things for October. And if, the, if we need to approve the plan formally, then we could possibly do it at the end of this month. How many focus groups did they do in that burn one? Do you remember? Um, I believe it was three. It was an evening one with community members. And I know they provided, I believe, three different groups based on the language spoken. Um, and then daytime one for staff members. So the evening one was actually like three small mm -hmm, classrooms? Okay. So small simultaneous or yeah, so um it may have been two because I know they split up to facilitate. Yeah, I, I agree, with Kevin. At least I, I I like the idea of doing it earlier in case we find wow, we just didn't get the turnout we wanted, and then we need to regroup and work in another one. We've got a little bit of time if we started in October because we we've said this before as a board we want to be sure that our community like they've had ample opportunities to participate and, and one evening meeting might not be enough really to capture the opinions that we want to get and what does did their focus group look like how did they run them it was um a room like this and wayne and mark facilitated with the three questions um he shared um, uh, and I sat somewhere in there taking notes um, on the community members' response. And so then the survey, though, also feeds into that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if someone doesn't want to come to a focus group right. or go online to a focus group where they're, they don't feel like their voice, they've got a place there, they can do the survey. Right. Okay, I'll get back to Wayne and see where we go from there. Sounds good. All right. Thank you Thank all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your work on this. Yeah. Okay. Next item on the agenda 3.02 is a report on the way the administration of the district will be managed during the next nine months before the new superintendent takes over. Dr. King's final day is rapidly approaching. Um, you know, but we're not backfilling Mark's position uh, as he's assistant superintendent for business and support services, um, and he'll return to that position when the select but in the interim. Others are going to be picking up some of his work. He will still be doing some of that work. We made this decision because of our confidence in the current executive team and the direction they're leading the district. However, it means that for nine months, four leaders, Mark, John, Kelly, and Faye, will be taking over the responsibilities that five leaders are currently doing. The four remaining executives will be absorbing Dr. Quinn's responsibilities. So the executive team has done a lot of planning for this transition and our 
and they want to ensure that all critical functions are covered and the level of district support for students, staff, and families is not diminished. We've hired several new administrators to assist them in this work. However, it would be unfair of us to expect everything to remain exactly as it's been. Dr. Quinn and the other members of the executive team have traditionally worked 50, 60, sometimes 70 hours per week. So it's not just a matter of putting in more time. So we asked for this on this agenda item. Um, so we could get a better sense of the details of the plan our executives have developed for a nine-month transition period with the new superintendent. So at this point, I'm going to call on Dr. Quinn and Mr. Debach to present the plan. Um, and I'll start, Andrew. You both have two, I mean, you all have two pieces of paper in front of you. Uh, one was last year's responsibility list that has five columns. And I'm going to tell you that we didn't spend as much time on that one last year. We put it together and we organized it, but we, we've spent a little more time on the one for this year uh, so that it's a little more comprehensive. I'm not going to go through all of it, but um, I want you to see that there is a plan. And if you flip over the one that says, 20, it still says draft on it, and I've already got two mistakes. Um, but on the, I will, I'll start on the front page. So everyone who's listed under those columns, um, the way you get on this list is you are either a district administrator or you work in the district office or you don't have a home and you're evaluated by a district administrator. You're an itinerant worker, like our techs are gonna be put on here. So it, it gives you an idea of who's evaluating who. Um, Kelly has the most evaluations because she has five nurses, but um, that she evaluates. And but um, and and it also shows you how many district administrators we're going to have. It and since people are always interested in that number, um, we had twenty nine before the levy. We went to twenty two. When I leave, there'll be twenty seven. So um, and then when the new superintendent comes. If that's an ad, there'll be 28. So we're still one fewer than we had before the levy. And one of those new administrators is Martina, who's doing technology. And that's really a trade out for a much more expensive model than we had previously. So, so the, that's the people in blue. So um, if you turn it over, you'll see that. Um, John's the only one who doesn't have any other administrative staff working directly for him. Everybody else has other administrators that are working for them. And five of those, six of those administrators are actually central administrators. They're not tied to a building. Most of those are under Mark's name, four of the six. And so you can see that even though Mark, Mark is going to have my, he's going to have the general oversight. He's not going to take on all of the work that I've been doing. We've split that out and, and we've backfilled some of it. We've um, enhanced both Holly and Jamie's position. They've been with us, but we've enhanced, given them a, an enhancement and they're taking over um, some of that work. Uh, Jamie's big new ad is he's taking over transportation and he's also stepping up to work with the bond projects. Um, Holly is going to be doing some of Mark's current well, she's doing nutrition services. So both Holly and, and Jamie have another department they're running. But um, and but then Martina and Selena are the other two new administrators. Selena is taking up is going to be taking a picture of my work is well, my work in the last year since we haven't had a communications team. But if you you'll have a chance to go through this, not everything from my list went directly to. Mark's list. Um, for instance, Kelly is taking over the district improvement plan, which has been on my last list. Faye is taking over the oversight of the governance policies. Um, and, and so with all that said, I think we've thought through everything, but, but I, um, I want to reiterate what Andrew said. Um, I think it would be unfair to expect that everything's going to be the same. Um, what we've used as a screen is how do we maintain our service to students, staff, 
and families. I'm just going to be perfectly blunt. We haven't used as a screen. How do we maintain our current level of service to the school board? You know, I mean, you know, so there may not be. Uh, it's not that we're not going to communicate with you, but it may not be the same. I'm not sure if the governance policies will, there may need to take some lapse in some of those. Um, it, I'm going to say, because I'm leaving, I just don't think you can ask the four executives to do a lot of extra reports or, um, you know, I, I, I think you're going to have your hands full with your superintendent search. Um, I think we feel really confident that we can continue to keep going in the direction we're going, but there isn't going to be time to take on. Yeah. If you, does that make sense? Yeah. But I think it, um, I guess, Mark, what do you want to add? Something. <laughs> um, what do you want to take away? <laughs> but the big things that are going to, Mark, and they're huge things, is, you know, he the first thing on his list is oversight of business and support services. He's taking over the executive team, the liaison with the school board, district opposite operations and administrative policies, a lot of the rest of this. And when he and I have talked, he cannot give up the bond project. He cannot give that up. So the rest of the team is going to have to absorb. You remember when we started the bond project, the, the steering committee was Scott Britton, Linda Quinn, Jeremy Vincent, and Mark Debuff. Mark, you're the last man standing. And, and there is a whole bunch of institutional knowledge. We we're working really hard to get Jamie and Eric up to speak, but he cannot back away from that work. Um, so that has to stay. He and I have been doing it together, but he's been doing the lion's share of, of the actual construction piece of it. And so, um, but some of the other things, like I said, and it may be the governance policies, it may be whatever, may have to take a back seat for a little bit to some of um, some of the ser the service to our uh, But so, what are your questions? And, and it, you know, I, I also want to make sure you know we all look, always look at who has the longest line and everything. But please know. These are not equal little cells on here. <laughs> you know, these are not um, John's box there with COVID lead administrator <laughs> should be, if it were proportionate to the size of the work, should be about three pages long. I mean, and so um, they just aren't, but, but it's our best effort to, uh, We've, we've really tried to think through everything. Kelly, John, any addition? You know, I, I just want to make sure you know that we've given it a lot of thought on how, and we brought in new administrators to take to backfill. Um, so, I, I guess I would ask you guys, you guys. Um, that if we do ask for something that like puts you over the edge or it's like there's no way in heck, please tell us. Please just say it. I know in theory we're going to be Mark's boss, and sometimes it's hard to push back against who your boss is, but we don't do not know what your day-to-day -day life is like, and you have to help educate us and you have to tell us. No, this is just. Don't even go there. Please, please, please do that. <clears throat> yeah. That uh, is I, our expectation. Uh, yeah, I would ditto that. I mean, we, you know, we're a team. We work together, but we don't see what you guys are doing every day. So be honest with us and say, <laughs> you know, tell us where things are at and how, you know, we can help with those. Because sometimes, we ask for something and we don't realize that you know, what we think is this is this. 
and we need you to be honest with us during this interim. We appreciate that as well. Good. Thank you. And we appreciate the willingness of mm -hmm. the executive to take this on for nine months. And, um, we're going to do our best to get another superintendent in here on July 1. So Mark's hair doesn't look like mine at the end. <laughs> or Kevin's. <laughs> or mine. Well, it's, 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 it's over not too long. So, but we do appreciate it. And we know it's going to be a tough nine months. And so. But but we're I think we, we know you geared up for it. I know I, I I'm just thinking it's I still believe it's a better plan than bringing in someone who oh, we who absolutely they would have had to spend their time trying to get somebody else absolutely. to know how to tell them what to I, I so I still think it was the best choice and I think we you agree that it um, maybe not Mark but <laughs> I'll tell you. Six months from now. I'm going to read now. Six months from now, it'll only be three months more. <laughs> yeah, tonight's the night you start to say, oh, yes. <laughs> Bring it on. We can. But, but, okay, but that's so um, we're. Thank you, Pay. Yeah, we include you too, even though we keep looking over there. She's not here because she's not feeling well. No, she made the right choice. Yeah, so. I, I have a question before we end this topic. I see that um, that you have the relationship with Lumination under yours and and it's moved away from Mark's. He's not hey. doing that no more. And who is doing the MOA or the MOU with uh, the tribe? Well, that, that will all be with Faye. And, and the Faye has been with me all year heather's also been helping but heather isn't on this sheet well she is but um but it doesn't it doesn't make sense for mark in the next nine months to spend a lot of time building those relationships with it, it needs to go back to the new superintendent when it, the new superintendent comes because it's an important relationship but knowing that we were going to make this transition Faye and Heather and I have been doing most of that work in um, collaboration all year. So that Faye is already taking over working with the native advisors. Faye and Heather and I um, have been involved with like the AOM, you know, those kinds. So, so it'll be Faye. Okay, so the next meeting that we have, you have with uh, JOM, uh, will you be able to explain that? Your yeah, I, I, yes. Let's not forget to do that. Um, I, I'm sure they're going to want to know, you know, since Mark is now the superintendent interim, what the reason is for that change. And, and you know, it, it wasn't the superintendent before. It was Jill for a long time. You know, it was just, I took it over when we eliminated a position. I've always been closely involved. But I, I will I will tell JOM when at our next meeting. But I'll also I talk to Alexandria almost every day, so I'll make sure. But I'm sure the parents will want to know. Yeah, sure. Good point. And the other thing that I that I noticed is uh, the elementary level curriculum, uh -huh. the secondary level curriculum. Does STI fall into either of those? Both of them. That should be spelled out right here. Well, we don't spell out. I know you don't, but it should be noted. Okay. Okay, anything else? And um, when, uh, when does this change over to Mark? October 1. October 1. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you again. We continue to look forward to working with you guys. And all you staring with. All right. Then the next item on the agenda, 6.01, is a discussion of the Since Time Immemorial 
con uh, curriculum and the possibility of scheduling a presentation for the board by the new director of the Office of Community Education at OSPI. Jesse requested that we put this item on the agenda because she wants to share some of her learnings from a recent Washington State Indian Education Association conference that she attended. So at this time, I'm going to turn the floor over to Jesse. Okay. Um, the, the conference I went to was really uh, informative. And I, I thank you for uh, making that recommendation. That was good. I had a chance to meet with Dr. Laura Lynn from OSPI, who does the SCI uh, curriculum. Uh, she said she would love to do a refresher with the board, um, which would, you know, consist of uh, training, uh, uh, light training. Um, I would hope we could do it the next work session, um, because I think sooner the better. Uh, when I got on the board, I had no idea about STI. And I didn't know a lot of, I had to do a lot of research. Um, but I believe in 2015, right, it, it was passed under um, Senate Bill uh, 5433, and it became law to uh, have STI in all uh, Washington State schools from elementary. To middle school to high school, not just one classroom, but all of them. And that is to uh, help schools uh, learn about our tribe, the reservation, the surrounding reservations, and looks at as well. Uh, it's not just for Native kids, it's for all kids. So, um, once I got into the conference, I got to see other schools that used it and how they used it. And it was uh, kids for them to explore, you know, outdoors. Uh, I guess Bellingham's used it. Um, some of their classes took kids out on a boat, you know, to go learn about surrounding area. Uh, there's a lot of things that could be done. And then I found out the tribe also has the opportunity to have funding to help with uh, resources for the schools. So the money is there. All we need to do is tap into it. Um, they, uh, they wanted, uh, yeah, like I said, for a lot of the, um, um, classes in every level. So they have benchmarks. I think I sent you the, the copy of the benchmark, but Dr. Laura Lynn, she will uh, update on us with that. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what I got out of it. And then um, it was, it is now required. It is not just recommended. Um, and my question is, what is the difference between mandate and law? Because this is now law, it's not mandated. That's, yeah. I can't speak to that at this point. I, I mean, I'm just putting it out there. Do you have a sense of what um, the the training would look like? I'm all I'm all for it. I got I was lucky enough to get to go. I can't yes. remember what year that was. It was it was right about the time. It was actually before it went from a recommendation to a law. And I, and I put that in the report that I wrote to you a few months ago. But you as a board um, did a resolution to start teaching it before it became a law. And it, it did become a law in 2015, uh, but th this board had already um, passed it as a local law. So I think we went to that training. We, you and I, yeah, you and I went to, it was out at the casino. Yeah. And it is, they, they 
I don't know how she's going to do it, but it gives you like this overview of the resources that are there, which are incredible to pull from. Yes. So um, I would be excited. Do you have a sense of what that would look like? You could look it up on the uh, in the website too. They have all kinds of resources. You know what you could do in a curriculum, all that type of stuff. Yes, we're doing some. Like, like I said, it's not just for native kids; it's for all kids. So that's going to be a really. I have a question to to Kelly and to Faye, and then with a follow up to you, Jesse, is what are we doing now? And then Jesse, what what more do we need to do, like specifically? Well, the way I look at it is now the elementary is doing something, right? I do not know. And um, maybe if Kelly and Faye can tell us what we are doing. Okay. I see Faye just was getting going. Go ahead, Faye, if you want to start. Oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, a lot of um Jesse, if you remember in the um report that we put together a few months ago a lot of um we outlined a lot of what was happening at each grade level uh, we do a lot particularly in middle school at seventh grade with the whole um semester on pacific northwest history um so that's where a significant amount of um, our sti curriculum is taught at the middle level and then it's entwined in different um, parts of social studies classes throughout um middle and high school Thank you, Faye. At the elementary level, as like Faye said, we kind of we outline it, but I would say it's not, um, we're not as tightly aligned at every grade level. We're going off the recommendations that we find on OSPI, but in terms of specific curriculum we are using um, throughout the district, we are not aligned on that. We are using our guidance from the state, but we are um, still trying to be better, better defined in what what resources we are using to implement within the classroom. So it depends on which classroom they're in or which school they're at. It's very our grade levels are um are more and more alike in terms of our collaborative efforts. So a lot of times we are coming together saying, okay, how are we utilizing these resources at this grade level? So we are doing a lot of grade level planning district wide, but we don't always have the access to the exact same, you know, books or materials or things like that. So we are doing quite a bit of collaboration, but we're just not completely aligned in how the materials we're using or the resources we're using to present all of the content. Would you like me to resend the 23-page report I sent you in March? Um, because I surveyed all of our staff, all of our principals, and asked them what we were doing. Um, and I just found that report. And Heather, I also consulted with Heather. Heather served as a, and maybe you can share a little bit, you served as a liaison with the, with the Lummi Nation for a while. Um, I can speak specifically about our middle schools, um, just to let you know, Jesse, our middle schools um, teachers have done a really incredible job of partnering with the Lummi Nation. And part of it is a little bit more, we do a lot more with STPI, probably simply because I'm here. And so resources are readily available. But for the last three years, um, well, when our late chief was still alive, we, we have done assemblies. And since the COVID, we've done webinar assemblies where we have invited tribal members into our school to speak on behalf of um, the tribal governance and sovereignty and around treaty day. So we've done that sporadically a few times throughout the year in with collaboration with Horizon and Vista. Um, the, the, the barrier is just with SDI in general is SDI has resources available on online and then it tells us to partner with our neighboring tribes. So much of what we do as a Lummi Nation is an oral tradition. So it's really hard for teachers to find materials and to find resources. We, they do a really good job of piecemealing and, and and finding things that are public information, but as far as getting like that real in-depth understanding of who we are and where we come from, those, those things come in places like people coming to classrooms, like those kinds of things. So I will tell you that we are doing a far better job than we were five years ago. 
I will tell you that I have more teachers coming to me throughout the district now. How can I address this? And what are some good resources for that? So um, in the time that I have, I've been able to connect um, teachers K-12 with resources or people, or this would be a really good person to invite to your classroom and talk about this. But the barrier is, is, is we're oral people. And so we don't always have a lot of things that are in written publication and things that are in written publication are not necessarily shared with our outside community. So that, that is just, it is just a struggle. Um, but I will tell you, we, like I said, we are in a far better place than we were before. Um, we're working on the land acknowledgement um, educational video right now, and that's coming along nicely. We did the treaty day video. That was an amazing experience and brought up a lot of awareness. Um, anticipating that the land acknowledge video will do the same. But what I see is, um, is I always feel like I'm talking from two people. So in Ferndale, um, our friends in Ferndale are asking for that information. They ask me, how do I respectfully teach this? How do I respectfully explain that? And um, I think I think that's just huge, huge growing. It's, it's, it's huge growth between our two communities. And we're not anywhere where we should be. We're not anywhere where we can be, but we are going in the right direction. Um, I was um, meeting with Candace Wilson a couple of weeks ago when we were doing some interviews for the land acknowledgement and she's super excited about um, sponsoring um, picture books. And so we put together a list of some topics of picture books and some artists that she would love to contract out of the Lactamish Foundation picture books that would go into the classrooms. Um, you can buy a lot of them online, but they're Alaskan natives and Haida and they're not necessarily specific to us, but um, she's also working on getting copies of the um, early literacy books that um, the Early Learning Center has, because the Ballou family has published some that they use for their little learners at our Head Start and our daycare and getting copies of those and getting them to our classrooms in Ferndale. So it's, it's a work in progress. Um, I mean, I hope that I could reassure you that we are, we are doing really great things. Um, we are going in the right direction and there's just with anything that we do that's just we could always do more and we will continue to take steps forward and do the best that we can. The, and, and the curriculum resources that are online are great, but they are not easy for our teachers to use. I mean, even the ones that are general for the whole because there are a lot of resources, but there aren't a lot of lesson plans. And yeah. so, take, so that's what I hear, especially for the littles. You know, that it takes, it's a lot of work. It's beautiful um, primary source and, you know, set resources, but you got to really dig in. And that's why things like the Treaty Day and the land acknowledgement, where Heather worked with children with setting sun to put together these videos, and then we've been able to build lessons off of them that they can pull in some of these. And we did K-12 lessons for Treaty Day, and that's our the plan for this as well, right? Yes. So it's um, what the law says is not that we there isn't like a it's not like the ARC curriculum, you know, that comes and says what the law says is that there needs to be um, lessons taught at every grade level. It doesn't really specify. It's a, it says what some of the outcomes will be, but it doesn't specify which lessons. I think we're meeting the outcomes. But like Heather said, we could do better. In efforts to build up our library and our resources, when speakers come to classrooms, is it appropriate to videotape those or to record those, or is that not appropriate? Uh, for example, when um, Chief the late Chief the elite came, um, it, his belief is no, so we did not record that. Um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things that we share. Um, I'll, I'll say sometimes. So the the two webinars that we did have, the the panelists did not want to record. Um, 
they would rather much come on a second time and share the same information. And it just, it stems from, it stems from as a young girl growing up in, in a Native American community, my teaching comes when I'm in the longhouse. So when I'm sitting there and I'm listening and I'm observing, like I sit back here and I listen and observe. And, and even when I go like to exec meetings, I listen and observe. I don't say much at the beginning, but that's where you get the teachings is when you're sitting here and you're listening to the people that are supposed to be teaching you something. And so when people come and talk, that's kind of yeah, it's kind of where we're coming from is it's not necessarily we make this recording and then we blast it all over the state so that everybody could have this. So it's kind of like that frame of mind and kind of the cultural teachings in which we were raised and how we teach our children. It's that's where you get it. So it's kind of you're in the longhouse and there you get the teaching. And if you're not, you don't. It makes it makes a lot of sense being from oral tradition the main way of teaching. But if you have a limited number of people who will, can come to do the teachings, then you have an also limited number of students who get the benefit of it. And I totally agree with you that actually firsthand hearing it is much better than watching a video, but some sort of balance of doing it in a respectful way, a respectful way of the culture, not saying, well, it works for me if I just get a YouTube clip. Well, the balance, not the ba the the balance is the, these videos that we're making with a lot of thought and care in very close collaboration with the Lemmy. So those are- and in, the, and in those things, like that, that is vetted through our culture and our language department. And so we're actually going Tuesday to edit the first long cut with our language and culture department, because, you know, they might say, oh, Heather, you said this, and that's not how, that's not the accurate truth, or you shouldn't say it that way. Let's cut that piece off. So there's certain vetted things. So that's how we did the Treaty Day video, and that's how we're doing the land acknowledgement video. So we can share that publicly because it's been vetted through our own process. But, you know, I agree. I agree. It doesn't necessarily work for every platform or every culture. But when somebody says, can I record it? Generally, the answer is no. Because no, I, I have asked Heather a yeah. lot of times. Yeah, I think like you had said, there's a lot of people in Ferndale who really want it. But there's a lot of care that goes into how it's presented. And the two of them are not always. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I think it's important to like work with Candace and the Lactamish Foundation and her aspiration for publishing these children's books, right? Because that's a huge, huge, huge piece of literature and knowledge that we can be sharing publicly with um, our friends in Ferndale. It, it, it's important that it's done you know, respectfully, like you said. And honestly, there's a lot of YouTube videos that would do a lot better if they had been edited and eliminated. <laughs> Yes. You know, I, there are, I think our teachers are, are ready and willing to teach. It's, but there was a kindergarten teacher and I really wanted to teach Lummi words to kids. And that we were respectfully asked that that not happen. That is not an appropriate thing. The same teacher could teach Spanish words and it probably, but it's a different, and so, we, tr we tried to be respectful and we've stepped on, to stepped on toes at times and then, but um, we're working on it. And I think we've done, we've done, we, Ferndale, we have done a lot to mend that relationship over time. Yeah. There's, there's things that we wouldn't have gotten done without Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, you know, a, a, a key partner in building the relationships with one nation. So we're far deeper down the bunny trail than we were just a few years ago. So relative to timing of the presentation, um, you know, as, as we look ahead to what's going on in the fall, um, our policy on social studies is up for review in November. November, I think it's Native American month, and it'll be the re the release of the new video. And also in November, October, we usually have a joint school board, the Lummi school board. And I'm just wondering if we 
want to try to coordinate around those things to have a, a special presentation. Does it make sense to do it in November when we're leading up to the policy review of social studies and how we're doing in this area and Native American month and our joint meeting with the Lummi Nation School Board? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? What, well, I believe that when I was talking to uh, Dr. Uh, Lynn, she was, uh, to me, it was more like uh, uh, the refresh would be like our like our, it's just overview. Um, Did you say you wanted to invite the Lummi board as well? Did you, when you talked to me the first time? No. Okay. We could. Okay. So do you, is she? Oh, we could do a Zoom. Oh, it would be Zoom. Okay. Yeah. We could make that work. Yeah. Uh, to, just a refresher, you know, it sounds like we've done this before. I didn't know that. Uh, we we did yeah we have it yeah right so oh. this would be good for all of us to do it out because I need to refresh it right I I I I I like what you had to say you know uh, about the things that are going on I I could talk with you for hours <laughs> but I believe we need a uh, not I mean. You know, we're trying to make this happen, make it work. And I think part of it is the breakdown is uh, we need to office out of Lummi to, you know, make sure it's happening. Uh, they, the teachers get the resources they need, uh, and we're not saying the wrong thing. <laughs> um, but I think that's something we can work on somehow. We can make that happen. So we can roll it out to you know, high school, middle school, elementary, because I believe there's a lot of uh, adventure in taking on this curriculum. And you know, I know the kids will love it. Yeah. And I think like if there's high school curriculum, like the children's books that you're talking about, I was like, if there's something equivalent for high school, then adults in the community can take care or take advantage of that as well. Oh, I mean, yeah. there's a lot, it doesn't just happen for kindergartners with a picture book, but can happen like all throughout your life. That's true. And there was a time, Jesse, and I think it was maybe a couple of years ago, Dr. Cohen, I don't remember, but um, I was, there was a, there was a committee at, at home in Lummi and the committee was working on building a resource bank and Travis Brocky was heading it. And so the idea was this resource bank would be much like, here's the STI standard, here's all the things. And then, then these things would be appropriate for, here's the, here's the Lummi approved resources that would be good for kindergartners. Here's the Lummi approved that would be good for second graders all the way up to 12th graders. So that work started and then, um, there's change in leadership. And then I don't really know where that is right now. I know um, 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 Seattle to Luck and um, Alicia, Alicia and I, when we were talking about it, um, pulled also pulled up the late um, Doug Bob's resources that he has built in the, in the culture department of all the educational resources that could be shared. So I think it's just, probably maybe having a conversation with maybe some of our tribal leaders about making that a priority and pulling those resources together because teachers want them. We, we in Ferndale, the district wants them, but we have to know what's appropriate and available to you. So that might be somewhere you could help us advocate too. I know Omagalese was working on some stuff. What's that? Omagalese. Oh yeah. And uh... She sounded like she had a lot of. And Dr. Tom's working on a bunch of stuff now down at the. Who's that? Pardon? Who's that? Let's see. My sister. Okay. Lexi, Dr. Tom. Okay. A lot of resources. Yeah. We just need to figure out how the uh, tribe's going to pull them together. Jesse, I sent again the report, and I did. Um, it it does have a report from every school on what they're doing. Granted, it's not. It's the one that I sent you all. Okay. And it's, I so, surveyed all the schools. 
Thank you. So why don't we ask Jackson to look for a time in October? I, I'm, I actually don't recall, but I don't think we have usually a study session in November just because of. We don't because the, usually the conference, the conference the becomes the session. But Jackson, could you do a, a, a calendar? Uh, I forget what it's called, but like an Outlook uh, meeting? Like, no, a do Google, a do doodle, doodle, a doodle, a doodle poll. Poll. Yeah, to find for, a date. For dates in October that we could consider doing this. Absolutely. We could coordinate that with if we're moving just as all the moving pieces. Yeah, it's a lot of moving pieces. The, well, it just so happens Jackson and Selena and I have a meeting coming up here. We'll we'll put all those <laughs> calendar pieces together and yeah. see what we can. It's, yeah, sounds good. You want a uh, time to for a study session to discuss yeah. this number. or a special meeting? Special meeting. Know what ends up on the agenda. The challenge, of course, is and this is by no means diminishing the importance of this. It's just as we head into the changes of October and the search starting and all, all the groups timing is going to be yeah. maybe more of a challenge, but I don't want you to think that we're not interested or willing to Thank you. times. It may just be uh, more difficult to find that time sooner than later. But uh, Jackson will start looking for that and we'll see what we can do with it. You can be our liaison with the person at OSPI. Yes. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's called one office one. of native education. That's right. Wow. Yes. All right. Any other comments or thoughts? Thank you for your feedback on this and for updating us on the conference today. Yeah. So the next item on the agenda is 3.04. And this is a discussion of the venue of our future Ferndale School Board meeting. So after the August 31st meeting, we received some criticism about the accommodations we set up for patrons who wished to make a comment, but were not willing to put on a mask. And as you recall, we had them set up out in the, just outside the door um, with a computer and chairs and they could make their comments from there. And, um, you know, I, I think so, you know, the criticism was that we put people out in the cold. Well, it was, you know, on August 31st, but it will be cold soon. That being the case, it will be cold soon and it will probably be rainy. And we do want to hear public comment. And so one option that we have is to consider um, going back to a virtual meeting. We're, we're allowed to do that apparently, and allow patients, uh, patients, <laughs> allow um, community members to make their comments via Zoom and, and Jackson would have to allow them to come in one at a time and exit so that we didn't have a Zoom bomb situation. Um, but it is something for us to discuss how do we want to do this because we do need to be able to, to allow public comment and we want to, but we want to do it in a way that is following the mandates, public health mandates that we're under. I'm not willing for us to not follow those public health mandates. I don't think we can choose not to follow those public health mandates. So would people who want to make public comment, would they have to sign up before the meeting starts or could they? I, how does it work on the back end, Jackson? When people sign into the webinar, they have to give us their email address or maybe some of you know, but can they raise their hand or make a comment or? Yeah, it depends on how you set it up. So you can set it up. People have to actually register um, to attend the meeting, um, which is a potential way to filter out some of the bombing and the, you know, uh, make sure they're actual legitimate email addresses and you can identify at least the. Um, and then, but then can they let us know that they want to be yeah. on the screen for it and then. Yeah. Jackson, because that's kind of what we did on August 31st. Yeah. It's just, yeah. What we did was, and this is what we have done in the past as well, we asked for name, of course, and then a phone number. And, and, um, and is, you know, and that's just, and that's how, you know, A, I mean, with Zoom, and then also, if we want to reach back out to the map, 
or let's say there, I know that in the last meeting we have a certain amount of time for the total amount of comments and you know, they're unable to get to us. You know? Yeah. Is, I mean, personally, I think us being in the same room works better for conversation and for discussing type things. And is it, is, is it any different or is it worse? You know, if they can from home, you know, have a hybrid situation where they can come in and, you know, if they don't want to wear a mask or they aren't willing to follow those guidelines, um, which we're under, you know, that's what we're going to be doing and we agreed to do. And I would be fine with having them come in via Zoom and replace face picture temporarily with them and, you know, have them up there. Because I, I personally, you know, it, it's super convenient just to be able to click on the computer from home, but I don't feel like our conversation is nearly as productive. Yeah, I think people could come in, wear a mask, and make their comment in person like a regular one, or the Zoom. Um, it's nice to see see them, mm -hmm. you know, but not, not everybody's going to have a camera. Um, and if they don't have a camera, they can't make it over a computer to write what they wanted to say and maybe have Jackson speak it or something. But the same sort of thing with time limits. And all. But not put that, do that outdoor thing we did the other day. Not through winter and every yeah, day. Okay. That's, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I think I, there was, with that one, I think there was a desire for the people to physically be here, though. So. At that time, if they weren't going to wear a mask, then outside was the closest they could to being here. I, I surveyed the other superintendents when we met last week, and uh, Bellingham has never returned to in-person meetings, so they're still doing everything via Zoom. The other six districts uh, in Whatcom County are doing in-person meetings. Um, they have had, um, they've had several of them had their school board meetings in September and the attendance is considerably down, like under 10 with just, so the, the large crowds and, and our crowd was small considered compared to some of the other ones. But we just thought it was worth talking. I don't know. Well, I, I think if we look, I remember, I always look to see how many people were logged in and I, we, we always seem to have many more people than we did face to face. And part of that is, may have been the ease of logging in from home. I think our attendance was higher when we had virtual meetings than when we didn't. I, so, well, I like this too. I don't think they can hear us as well, even with these. And that's some of the feedback that we've gotten is. It's garbled, we can't understand. And I would say that's probably one of the reasons our attendance has dropped off. Where if we go back to virtual, where we're in our own little square, they see our faces and they will hear us better. Well, let me just ask a clarifying question. Just, I'll throw it out there. Were those complaints about garbled sounds and voices from people who, are against mask or were they from the general public who used to attend? Because the only comments I've gotten that have commented on, I couldn't understand you through your mask were from people who didn't want to wear a mask. So I don't know if it's really a broad criticism from the public in general, or if it's just the folks who don't feel like masks are appropriate. I find it harder to understand people with masks on. I'm just asking. Yeah, I don't hear because people are talking louder, but if I'm talking face to face with somebody with quieter voices, I do rely on reading people's lips a little bit. Mm -hmm. But since everybody kind of projects a little bit more, I'm fine with this. When is the new system going to be in, Mark? Uh, hopefully, end of, uh, end of the month, they're coming to install it. It might be better. Or I, yeah. End of the month as an end of September? Yes. Before the school board or after? I would. I'm, we're not counting on it being operational for uh, September for 28. Okay. Yeah. So, can I ask? Have any of us? And I haven't. I'll admit that. First, have any of us went and looked at the recorded meetings or listened to them to see? 
They're all available on our YouTube. Have but you, but you have you been here? here? Um, I have because I've gone back while watching the minutes just to make sure I'm getting what you guys say accurately. Um, and it, to be honest, it depends on the person. I can hear okay, but I'm also, when I do that, I have like headphones on and it's in a quieter office, you know. So I guess it would just depend on how, what everyone's hearing levels are, how that like their headphones are, their computer speakers are. Well, I mean, that, that, I, I like your point that if we're virtual, we don't have to wear a mask. We can just speak and Belling, see our mouth. mouth. Bellingham being virtual, are they taking public comment, like inviting somebody into the Zoom room to do, because we didn't take any actual We only comment. read them. Um, I, don't, I think they're still just reading comments, but I can find out. I would think if we go back to virtual, I would want to be able to bring back verbal public comment from people. I would agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. There are districts that are doing that. Do you know, Kelly? Is Bellingham taking public comment? I do not know that. You don't know that. I guess if other districts are doing it, then it doesn't matter if Bellingham is or isn't, but yeah. as long as it's a possible thing, I think it's something that our constituents But there is a loss of the interaction for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I understand. Yeah. It's harder to have a conversation because you're worried if you're over talking somebody or yeah. <laughs> some of us are. Some of us don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for our <laughs> September meeting. Do we want to go virtual with trying the virtual comments? I mean, I'm sorry, the, the letting people into the room to make their comments as opposed to reading comments. Are we saying going virtual, going back to a Zoom meeting or? Going back to a Zoom meeting and allow people to enter our Zoom meeting and make their public comment and then exit again. I would prefer this format with allowing them to come in to make their comments and just us being cognizant that we have to do a little bit more to project their voices, but I can go to virtual too. So you're saying we would take virtual public comments? We would, I, I would say we would take, allow people to come in via Zoom to make public or to come in person if they wear a mask. If they wear a mask. Okay. That'd be my vote. I think I'd go with that one too. That's my one. Make their proposal. Oh, I would move that we would stick with the in-person meeting, and people are have the option of making public comment in mass, attending the meeting in mass, or if they would like to make public comment, and uh, prefer not to wear a mask, or for medical reasons can, then they would have the option of making a public comment using or convenience. Yeah, or convenience. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard. But no more outdoor. No more outdoor. No more out, yeah. All right. So, Kevin's proposed that we continue meeting in person, that we allow um, community members to attend the meeting as long as they wear a mask. And if they're attending and want to make a comment, as long as they're wearing a mask, they're free to do so. Um, community members who don't want to wear a mask are allowed to attend by Zoom and they can make their comments via Zoom to the board. I would, I would, that second part, I would say anyone can make a comment via Zoom. It doesn't matter why they're choosing Zoom, whether it's because they don't want to wear a mask, whether it's because they're cooking dinner and they're busy that night or whatever, I think, and anybody. Okay, just stress that those in attendance have to wear a mask. Anyone else can make a comment? Yeah. Sure. Well, and I think the, the flip side, not that it has to be part of that, but even, you know, if one of us is out of town or not feeling quite up to par, we could join by Zoom too. I mean, I think that's a totally legitimate. Okay. So I'm not sure if we need to actually vote on that or no, just consensus. consensus. Is everybody good with that? The only thing I'm wrestling with is um, a time limit. So I know we have a three minute time limit. And then last time around, we put like a 45 minute time limit on the public comment. Um, 
you know, our job at those business meetings are to do the business of the district. And so we have to make sure we have time to get that done. So do we think about an hour time limit or do we think about a time limit overall? Because virtual, great, it makes it easier. It also makes it easier. So I can come on, I can give I, I think we still, given everything that we're leading into, for September, October, November, I'm I'm very comfortable saying 45 minutes. Yeah, I mean, that's 15 three minutes people. per person. 45 minutes total. Yeah, I think is 15 comments, and if people want to submit further comment, they can do so in writing to Mr. Devon. Mm -hmm. And I think it'd probably be pretty rare we would get 15 comments each time. Yeah. I think it'll be done. I don't want to leave it open ended because it could take hours, and we have a lot of work to do over the next couple of months. And well, it's, it's not to curtail public comment, it's to curtail the time that we can allot to it and provide other avenues for people to make public comment. I mean, we can still get their comments, it just may not be at the board meeting. Yes, yes, I, I, I think that's right. Yeah. And if we find that we've got a particular need to hear or something, we can always adjust and then have something in place to yeah. I would hope that we the three minute limit would be enforced and would be enforced equitably. I think there are times where people, you know, on a virtual might hear the timer but just keep going. And Jackson I think we'll be able to put them off. <laughs> that's that's that easy. Easy. actually a virtual is a lot easier than in person. When they're in yeah, person. but but I think right. that yeah. I thought I we were pretty pretty good on time last time. Yeah. yeah. The virtual people actually were easier because we could, we just yeah. muted them. Yeah. Can we have a microphone that can be muted? Oh. We can try. Might be one to try. All right, then that's what we will do. Um, this isn't on the agenda, and so I'm probably breaking some protocol, but could we just have a quick update on opening the school before we go into executive session? Sure. Just how, did, uh, how did it go? It was great. I, as I said in my letter the other night, I, was, I, did, I did read your letter. Just, it was happy. I mean, Heather said it. It was, you know, she had been at the meeting the night before and it was kind of negative. We talked about on how unhappy the masks were making kids. And we were all out in schools most of the week. I just really didn't see anybody that looked very unhappy. Um, teachers were doing a great job. You probably also read that I told you our enrollment is below budget. It's not, a, the important distinction is it's not below. We haven't lost kids from last year. We just didn't have our optimistic projection that more of them would come back. So we're we're sitting sitting at very close to the same number we had last year. Well, we all thought COVID would be better. What? We, we, we thought, thought COVID would be better. We did think COVID would be better. Um, we are going to end up with a robust parent partnership program before this is over, and some people are finding out that's something they like. That over forty, we're pushing forty eight today. I was going to say we're getting closer to 50 kids in that program, which we've never had before. So, so, but no, it's, um, it's been good. Yes, I have something to add. I asked Andrew earlier if I could share this, um, what I thought was a very heartwarming success story. Um, Linda, you said that it was very happy and everybody was excited to be back, but I think we all know that there's also a lot of anxiety out there. Um, so a friend of mine had posted something on Facebook and then after a few days posted an update. So I got permission from her to read it and I've taken out names and such like that. But um, so she starts, my child, they're breaking my heart. Our school mornings are the same every morning. Mom, I'm really sick. My tummy hurts so bad. I can't go to school. Every morning, they take their temperature, trying and hoping to prove that they are sick. They're just anxious. Their tummy is in knots. They say they hate school, but at the end of the day, when I ask how their day was, the report is always good. 
a three out of five, and then a four out of five last week. Their tummy ache is always gone upon their return home. I tried to ease their anxiety by driving them to school. One of the things they were nervous about was finding the correct line for their class. I helped them the first two weeks of school. This is an elementary age child. I helped them the first two weeks of school. We tried all the tricks, essential oils, talking about school highlights, PE class, being positive, acknowledging and validating that the way they feel is real, but it's not a virus. They are not contagious and they can go to school. Breathing together. Told them times about their dad, me, cousins, all have felt anxious with tummy aches. They say over and over, I'm not anxious, I'm not nervous, I'm sick. But they're only sick Monday through Friday in the mornings. My mama hurts, my mama heart hurts for my child. Any other helpful tips we can try? So she had put this out to Facebook Universe. And a couple of days and about 50 comments later, she posted an update. Thank you everyone for your advice. I read every comment and have some great ideas and support. My child got off the bus today smiling and so excited to tell me that they got to go to the kid helping room today. I had emailed their teacher and the school counselor, Mrs. Dale, to let them know that my child is having a hard time. I wanted to loop them in because I didn't want my child labeled as not participating or disrespectful, for example, when they're just so nervous and un uncomfortable. They both emailed me back. Turns out my child is extremely shy, doesn't talk, doesn't play with anyone, even at recess, and is obviously uncomfortable when talked to. The teacher thought this is just their personality. The counselor pulled my child for a quick meeting this morning. My child said she is so nice and they look forward to going to the kid helping room if they need her help anymore. My child also told me that they're going to try positive self-talk with me in the morning. They're supposed to tell me at least one thing they could do to make their day great. My child gave me a few examples of positive self-talk even. I'm so glad I reached out to the school support system. They are there because they want kids to feel safe, loved, supported, and happy at school. My mama heart feels so much better. I'm looking forward to watching my child grow in confidence and with tools to cope with change and anxiety. I thought that that post and that letter, it makes me now even emotional because that, I think when people have an issue with their kids, they're like, I'll ask my friends. And to just think, to reach out to the school district, we are here, or you guys are here to help those kids. And that counselor, Mrs. Dale, she knew right, right what to do right away. And we know that there are a lot of kids that are feeling this way. And I think the one thing that maybe to do is it would have been nice if she knew first before asking Facebook world for advice that she could go to the schools. But I just, I love it. I hope you guys like it. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things we did do this year that was new is it in all for all students in grades K five during the first three days of school, we invited their families in with parent conferences, um, hopefully so that they could sit there and tell them things like that. They weren't parent conferences for the teachers to tell parents about their kids, but rather for kids parents to tell the teachers. Hopefully that would have been a time, you know, that could even share that my kid has this tummy ache, and you know, you know what? I'm, yeah, that that's our goal. As and as things develop throughout the year, it's like yeah, anytime. Yeah, anytime. Yeah. But right off the bat, to for that particular family and situation, it was a kindergarten family. So those first three days, they're doing parent conferences and walk kids evaluation. So their conferences were just a little bit different. Okay. So, so okay. So it wasn't the same kind of conference. They they had some different conferences, but the timing is just a little different. Yeah. But but just because of what exact I'm just saying exactly what you're saying. We want them to know that we want them to tell us how to make What is that your what is your kid? Partnering together you can better meet the needs. Yeah. Yeah. Well thanks. I'm glad it was a good opening. It was a good opening.
Cool. All right. Well, um, at this time, the board's going to go into an executive session for about 30 minutes to talk about some personnel issues. And then following the executive session, the board will take action on the two consent agenda. So let's take a five minute break and we'll meet in the back.
All right, we will reconvene. Uh, next item on the agenda is the uh, consent agendas. And these are items that the board has had a chance to review prior to the, uh, taking action. Um, but we can do it as a step process rather than each individual item. With that being said, we realized during our executive session that the contract for the interim superintendent was not attached to the uh, consent agenda. And uh, therefore we can't actually vote on that. And so we have to postpone that. And I apologize to the parties involved for not being more on top of that. So I will take responsibility for that oversight. That being said, there were other items on the consent agenda. And so at this point, I'll entertain a motion. So I would move to approve the superintendent and the board consent agenda minus 6.01. All right, it's been moved to adopt the, or to approve the superintendent and the board's consent agenda minus item 6.01. Is that? Mm -hmm. okay. yes. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So with that, we have reached the end of the agenda for the September 15th special meeting. Um, so before I adjourn, I wanna ask my fellow board members and members of the SEC team if there's anything else they want to share for the good of the order. All right, so our next board meeting will be on Tuesday, September 28th. Um, and of course, we've made some changes to how we will meet and that information will be made public. Um, we will start at seven o'clock here in the Vista Library and uh, board will be here, but we'll have Zoom set up for people to attend. Um, and Jackson will make that clear for the public as well. So thank you for your participation this evening and I hereby declare this meeting adjourned. Can we get Yeah, I